So far we've focused on the differential rate law, which relates the rate of change of concentration with time to the concentration of a reactant. In this video we're going to take a look at the integrated rate laws, which have a ton of practical applications. They're a lot more practically useful than the differential rate law because they don't involve these instantaneous changes which can be difficult to measure and work with experimentally. The integrated rate law actually gives us a concrete relationship between concentration and time. This means, for example, that we can fit experimental data of concentration versus time to determine the order with respect to a particular reactant. We can also use the integrated rate equation in a purely theoretical way to predict the amount of product we'll have after a given amount of time, or to predict the amount of reactant remaining after a certain amount of time, or to find the amount of time required to achieve a particular conversion. In this video, we're going to look at zero first and second order reactions, their associated integrated rate laws, and introduce the concept of half-life, which is the amount of time required to consume half of a reactant given an order and an integrated rate law. So thus far we've looked at differential rate laws in detail, but this pesky DADT term can make differential rate laws difficult to work with experimentally since this is theoretically anyway an instantaneous rate of change, which is arguably impossible to measure exactly. To get this in a form that's more experimentally useful and a little bit more intuitive mathematically, we can rearrange this equation to collect all of the concentration terms on one side and all of the time terms and everything else on the other. So if, for example, we multiply both sides through by negative 1 and divide by the concentration of A, to the m power, we get all the molarity of A terms on one side and negative kdt on the other side. To eliminate these differentials, since we separated the variables on both sides of this equation, we can integrate both sides. The resulting equation is going to contain the concentration and time variables and illustrate the relationship between concentration and time, and it's known as the integrated rate law. I haven't written it in an explicit form just yet because the exact form of the integrated rate law is going to depend on the value of m. So for example, when m is equal to zero, we're in a zero order situation and this entire molarity of a to the n term becomes one. This means we're integrating dA on the left hand side and negative kdt on the right hand side. If we imagine some initial concentration a of zero, a at time equal to zero, then the concentration at some arbitrary later time, which we'll just represent as A throughout this discussion of all the rate laws, is equal to that A0 minus KT, and this falls out of this integration process. Graphically, if we think about plotting this on a graph of time on the x-axis and the concentration of A on the y-axis, this represents a linear decrease in A with time. In the first order case, this M value is equal to 1. The resulting integrated rate law says that the concentration of A is equal to that initial concentration of A at time 0 times e to the negative kt. So this is an exponential decay of the concentration of A with time. And the only thing I'll point out here is, first of all, that, of course, this decrease is now curved rather than linear, and notice that the rate decreases as time goes on and the concentration decreases. This is consistent with the corresponding differential rate law, which basically says the rate is directly proportional to the concentration. So it makes sense that the, the curve flattens out as we move for, forward in time. In the second order case, we're integrating dA over A squared, and the resulting integrated rate law here is 1 over A, the concentration at some arbitrary future time is equal to 1 over the initial concentration at time t equals 0 plus kt. And even though the plus sign makes it look like the concentration might be increasing, notice that we're dealing with 1 over a on the left hand side, and so this does indicate that the concentration is decreasing with time. And again, if we plot time on the x-axis and concentration of a on the y-axis, we end up with a curved decrease. This time it's not an exponential decrease, but an inverse type decrease in the concentration with time. So these three equations are the integrated rate laws for zero, first, and second order processes. And their utility really comes in the manipulation of these three variables, the concentration of A, the initial concentration, and the time. So say for example we knew 
the initial concentration and the time elapsed, we could easily calculate the concentration at that future time point using the known variables. We could flip around the knowns. So we could, we could say if we know the initial concentration and our target desired concentration, we can use the integrated rate law to calculate the time required to reach that point. Finally, we can use the integrated rate law fit to experimental data to first of all determine what the order of reaction is for a particular reactant, and second of all, identify the value of K just by looking at the slope of the graph in the zero order case, or after a linearization procedure, the slopes of related plots for the first order and second order cases. One of the most useful reaction times now that we've discussed the integrated rate law is known as the half-life, or T1 half. T1 half is the time required for half of a reactant to be converted into product. In other words, it's the time necessary for the initial concentration of a reactant to be divided in half in the course of the reaction. To calculate this, we need to know the order of reaction in the integrated rate law. And we treat this like a problem in which we know the initial concentration, and we know the target concentration, and we're looking for the time required to reach the target concentration, which is half of the initial concentration. So we're going to use the idea that the initial concentration is twice the target concentration along with the integrated rate law. So in the zero order case, for example, our target concentration is equal to the initial concentration, which is twice the target, that comes from the definition of half-life, minus kt, and that part comes from the integrated rate law, which says that the concentration of A is equal to the initial concentration minus kt. This t is t one half, the half-life. And if we do a little bit of rearranging and solve for t one half, we find that T1 half is equal to the target concentration, that is half of the initial, divided by K, the rate constant. You'll probably see this equation in a different form that actually substitutes in A0 for A and divides by 2. In other words, it uses the idea that the target concentration is 1 half of the initial concentration. Substituting that in for this equation above gets us to the result that the half-life is equal to the initial concentration, A0, divided by 2K. And this is the typical half-life for a zero-order reaction. So the interesting result here is that the half-life depends on the initial concentration. That should feel intuitively right for a zero-order process, which represents linear decrease in the concentration of the reactant. I'll switch colors for the first order case, but we're going to use the same idea. The concentration of A is equal to the initial concentration 2A e to the negative kt, where the t here is t one half. If we take the natural log of both sides of this equation, we can get t one half by itself. But a couple of other interesting things happen. Notice that when we take the natural log of a on the left-hand side, we get natural log of A. When we take the natural log of the right-hand side, we get a natural log of A term, which subtracts out the natural log of A term on the left-hand side here, since we'll get the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of A minus kt one half. After doing some rearranging, we arrive at the idea that the negative natural log of 2 is equal to minus kt one half. And the ultimate result here, if we multiply both sides by negative 1 and then divide by k, is that the half-life for a first-order process is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by k, the rate constant. And what's interesting about this equation is that the initial concentration of A does not appear at all. So the half-life is independent of the initial concentration of A. Again, intuitively, this should make sense. For a first-order process, the rate is dependent on the concentration of A. So if we start with a higher concentration of A, the rate will simply increase so that the reaction goes more quickly and the half-life ultimately ends up being the same amount of time regardless of the initial amount of A. For the second order process, I'm going to switch back to blue. And I'm going to use the initial concentration of A directly. So here it's 2 over that initial concentration of A since our target is 1 over the initial concentration over 2, so we end up with 2 over A0 is equal to 1 over A0 
plus k times t one half. And here it's actually not terribly complicated algebra to solve for t one half. We simply subtract one over a zero from both sides and then divide by k and we end up with t one half for a second order process is equal to one over k times a zero. So once again in the second order case we're back to a situation where the half-life does depend on the initial concentration of reactant. But in contrast to the zero order case, the larger the initial concentration, the smaller is the half-life. The reaction more than compensates for an increase in concentration with a very large increase in reaction rate. It's definitely worth putting these three equations down on your crib sheet for T1 half, but it's also worth appreciating the method we used to come to these equations which is just an application of the integrated rate law. You can apply the integrated rate law to find the amount of time required to reach any conversion of product, not just 50% or, or half consumed. You could apply it to find 20% conversion time, 80% conversion time, 90% conversion time, etc., whatever you're looking for. The same general procedure as we applied here applies in those cases as well.